Do you even know how much sperm costs? That was Mia, our video director. And that mm, ejaculation wasn't random. It was her very substantive response to a question I asked about half a dozen of my coworkers here at Bernie HQ. That question was this. What would you do if you didn't have student debt? I'm a queer woman, you know, and I'm nearing my early 30s. I would like to plan for a family. And one of the largest and most substantial considerations when you are with a female partner is how to get that going. Without student debt, I could start saying to myself, okay, this is what I want to do in the next five years of my life. I know that the numbers would add up comfortably for me to afford not only potential in vitro, potential, you know, fertility clinic visits, but knowing that my lifestyle requires those added measures for me to start a family. Without student debt, that's, it's a no-brainer for me. The answers were varied, but uniformly confident. This generation, millennials, though characterized as frivolous by a media class dominated by boomers and Gen Xers, only wanted the very basics. A family, a home, an opportunity to get more education. I have ambitions to pursue a career in public service, but I think that given the fact that, you know, starting salaries to work on Capitol Hill or $30,000 a year, et cetera, I don't think that that's necessarily sustainable. I would be helping pay my parents' mortgage. Yeah. I would be saving up to buy a house for myself. Yeah, do you even think about that now as a real possibility? It's like not <laughs> because I just have to focus on like paying the debt. So I think that I would probably be saving to purchase a home, saving for my retirement, mm -hmm. also saving to um, in the future help my parents out. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that they're getting up there in age and that's something that, although I'm the youngest, um, I am the only child with an education. Have you been able to save? At all so far? No, not at all. Right now I'm, I'm working on paying my loans. I feel like if I didn't have this debt now, I would have definitely be done with school by now. Mm. I want to, you know, start a family. I want to, sounds crazy, but I would be interested in even going to higher, like going higher than with my education than I have at this point. <laughs> this is so crazy. It, it sounds crazy. Talking about this now, like already talking about the debt that I have, I'm like, you must be out of your mind mm. to want to continue with your education. But I feel like it's my important. Heart. Yeah, that breaks my heart. It's important. You say that. There's so many things that you can do when you don't have that enormous amount of debt lingering over your head. This is Hear the Burn a podcast about the people, ideas, and politics that are driving the Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign and the movement to secure a dignified life for everyone living in this country. My name is Brianna Joy Gray, and I'm coming to you from campaign headquarters here in Washington, D.C. This week is all about student debt. We're going to unpack the revolutionary student debt cancellation plan Bernie Sanders released last week and debunk some of the biggest misunderstandings about the policy to cancel all student debt. Also, remember when black billionaire Robert F. Smith canceled the debt of every student in the graduating class of Morehouse, a historically black men's college in Atlanta? Well, we spoke to Jordan Long, the young man who would have been among those who had their debt canceled, if not for the fact that he had dropped out after sophomore year. Why? Because he couldn't afford tuition. Bernie believes that education is a human right. And this week, we're going to make the case to America. From the moment Bernie Sanders first brought the notion of free public college into the mainstream back in 2015, he's been met with fierce pushback, and not just from Republicans, but moderate Democrats who were committed to the argument that free higher education was just too silly to consider. Nobody got their loans forgiven. Think Do you that, think the 1% um, it, could pay for all of this? Yeah, I wish uh, it could have happened to me, but I don't think it's good <laughs> economics or good policy. But after his unexpected success in the 2016 primary, more and more Democrats began to come around to the idea that public education shouldn't stop at 12th grade, especially if we live in a society that increasingly demands post-secondary education 
to secure a dignified, healthy life. Today, nearly every major candidate includes some kind of free post-secondary education as part of their platform, including Joe Biden, who in 2005 backed the bill that makes it impossible for students to discharge our debt through bankruptcy, making student debt a life sentence, no matter what. There was this push uh, by Biden, he was a key Democrat, pushing the bankruptcy bill uh, that was ultimately signed by President George W. Bush uh, that eliminated the ability of most Americans to seek bankruptcy protections not only for their government loans, but also for their private student loans. Now, Elizabeth Warren has gone farther than most with her plan to cancel student debt. But it only goes as far as canceling $50,000 of debt tops and her plan cancels progressively less debt for those making over 100 k Last week, Bernie blew all the competition out of the water with his plan to cancel all student debt. All of it. Every last penny. Your debt is canceled if you incurred it in grad school. It's canceled if you took it out for housing or books for school. It's canceled if your parents took it out for your education or if you're a parent yourself paying for your kids. They're canceled if you consolidated or refinanced your loans. They're canceled if you're on a loan forgiveness or pay what you can earn plan. Your loans are canceled if you went to trade school, public college, or private school. It's all canceled. Canceled, 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 canceled. So how do we pay for it? Well, the plan will cost about $1.6 trillion. That's about the same as Trump's tax cut. But 85% of Trump's tax cut went to the top 1%. Bernie thinks it's time for the banks we bailed out to help bail out Americans. And that's why his debt cancellation plan will be paid for by a 0.5% transaction fee on speculative trading. Over the span of 10 years, that is estimated to add up to well over $2 trillion, more than enough to cover everyone's student loans. In short, Wall Street is footing the bill. Bernie's plan will help 45 million Americans, the overwhelming majority of whom are low income or middle class. 80% of all student debt is held by those making less than $127,000 a year. And families making less than $60,000 a year took out 280% more student loan debt than families making over 100K, according to a 2013 study. It's important to recognize that this bill goes a long way to closing gender and racial disparities. Women hold two-thirds of all student loan debt. And according to one study, if we canceled all student loan debt back in 2016, we would have shrunk the racial wealth gap between young, white, and black households ages 25 to 40 from 12 to 1 to 5 to 1. Moreover, it will help the economy, which helps everyone, regardless of whether or not they personally hold student loans. Republican tax cuts often don't stimulate the economy because they go only to the 1%, who invest in themselves rather than America. But Bernie's College for All plan means that people like you and me will finally be able to buy homes and have kids if we want, spend our checks on consumer goods rather than sending them off to Great Lakes every month. Bernie's plan will create 1.5 million new jobs every year and boost our economy by $1 trillion over the course of the next 10 years. One study even showed that even if you don't have debt, debt cancellation raises your salary by an average of $4,000 over a three-year period. Now, if I sound a little giddy, it's because I have a substantial amount of student debt remaining from law school. I graduated eight years ago and have been making $2,300 monthly payments since I started my first job at a law firm. And yet I still owe nearly $100,000 of the 180 I originally took out. So if you're doing some math and asking why, the answer is interest. According to my first 1099, I paid about $18,000 of interest versus $5,000 of principal my first year. And I got to tell you, when I saw that breakdown, I literally dropped to my knees in my studio apartment and sobbed. I was lucky enough to be able to keep up with my payments, but the prospect of having to stay in a high stress, unsatisfying job for a decade, just so that I didn't fall behind, was 
more than a little demoralizing. And I recognize that I'm pretty lucky in the grand scheme of things. I'm actually a little bit embarrassed about the size of my student loan debt. So I won't get into specifics, but I will say that if I were to pay the minimum amount um, for the full term, I would still owe a million dollars on my debt. So I've just decided I'm going to die with my debt. Like I don't, I, I don't have any other way of discharging it. I'm not going to be a billionaire. So <laughs> uh, what else am I going to do? That was Malika Jabali, lawyer, journalist, and a friend of mine who you might remember from episode six of the podcast when she joined me for a conversation about electability. I reached out to Malika because among my friends, she has one of the higher debt burdens, and it's a pretty competitive field. So how did this happen? First, she got a master's degree, which costs about $100,000 despite scholarships. And then I got my law degree, which was about 200000 Right, from Columbia. Yes, both of them from Columbia. And for my law degree, they required us to take out loans. They said, if you want any free money, if you want any grants, you must take out student loans. So I didn't really have much of a choice. You know, if I wanted to go to law school, that was that was what I had. What I'm paying doesn't doesn't even cover the interest. And the interest. Oh, man. The interest. I get twenty five thousand dollars in interest a year, which will just keep compounding. I've been working in, in government and public service since I graduated. Even though she's taken advantage of public interest loan forgiveness programs, which forgive debt after working in public interest jobs for 10 years, Malika has still been struggling to keep up. I couldn't afford like $1,200. They're only covering like two thirds of it. So even with that one third payment left, it, was, it would have been too much for me to, to cover it with my income because I still had my previous grad school debt. I went with the, the federal government program, and so I did that one and just didn't bother with my schools because I, I would have still been paying too much out of pocket and I couldn't afford to because I wasn't. I was making like $50,000 coming out of law school working in public service. What would you do, Malika, if you didn't have that debt? Like, has it ever affected your career choices? I mean, I would have gone to law school in the first place if I knew that, like, a creative career could fund my life. I heard this story again and again. This is Ariana, who works in the campaign's advance team. You heard her at the top of this episode, saying that if she didn't have loans, she'd be helping her parents with their mortgage. Honestly, that's also part of the reason why I didn't go to grad school is because I was like, I want to at least get like half of my student debt, like cut in half or something like that, pay it off. And I haven't been able to do that. So what kind of grad school do you think you would have wanted to go to? I would love to go to USC, Mm -hmm. so University of Southern California for global health or Mm. public health. That's the dream. so. So we could have another young person helping us with global health crises if she weren't feeling so burdened by her student debt yes. and the, the student debt incurred by the rest of her family members, which everyone has to kind of pitch in and help with. Exactly. You'll remember that Mia, who opened this episode, is the campaign's video director. She explained that her loans, though relatively small, were a real obstacle for her because pursuing a career in video requires significant outlays on equipment. Equipment you might not be able to afford if you have student debt. I always had to trade Am I going to invest in secondhand gear or am I going to put off the job, the gig, the photo shoot that I want to do because my interest is just going to get higher and higher and my, pre- uh, not the premium, the principal, mm-hmm. you know, just never goes away. And it really did break my heart to hear Erica, a Howard student and second generation immigrant, describe her dream of going to law school as crazy just because it's so expensive. This is an important point. The cost of school is robbing us of public health workers, public interest lawyers, policy experts, politicians, and talented creatives. In just 30 years, the average cost of public four-year universities has tripled from $3,360 to $10,000 per year. And that $10,000 doesn't include the cost of room and board. At the same time, Real hourly wages for college graduates have remained all but stagnant since 2001. 
with the median growing by less than a dollar. As a result, two-thirds of today's college students graduate with debt. The average is nearly $30,000, with one out of six owing more than 50K. And with the bottom 80% of earners in this country holding 1.1 trillion of the 1.6 trillion total student debt, this is not primarily a problem for rich kids, despite what you might have heard. In fact, marginalized groups are particularly affected, like black women who owe a disproportionately high amount of debt. Among African-American borrowers who started school in 2003, balances have grown by a median 113% over the 12 years following graduation. And during the same period of time, one in two have defaulted on their loans. There's something really perverse about a narrative which says, if you want to close the racial wealth gap, go to school, achieve, get a certain kind of job, but which ignores that getting an education can be a double-edged sword. Now you've brought the people who are trying to change their class or just learn more. Now those people and their families who are taking these parent plus loans, now they're going to be shackled by debt. So they're being punished just for trying to get ahead or learn. And that is more than a shame. It needs to be changed immediately. It should have been changed yesterday. And it needs to be changed today and tomorrow. That was Jordan Long, who made headlines earlier this year after he tweeted about how it felt to have dropped out of the 2019 class of Morehouse after sophomore year due to costs, only to find that Black billionaire Robert F. Smith announced he would pay the tuition balance of the entire graduating class on graduation day. It was a life-changing moment for the school's overwhelmingly Black student body, who, as I mentioned, are particularly burdened by student debt. But for Jordan, it was a painful reminder of how college costs create winners and losers not based on meritocracy, but on dumb luck. He walked me through finding out the news on what would have been his graduation day. My sleep schedule was off that day. I remember waking up really early in the morning and seeing everyone getting ready for graduation. I saw like all these tweets about a billionaire and paying off loan. And I'm like, what? And then I like, and then it's like on the top thing of Twitter, I'm also seeing my Morales brothers tweeting about it. And I'm like, wait, what? And then I text my friend, I'm like, oh my gosh, congratulations. Like, wow, like you guys got all your stuff paid off as like an open moment where you're like, look under your chairs, everybody. And then I was like, also like, wait a minute, that could have been me. I was like, damn, that really, really sucks. I'm gonna have to hear everybody who's like ignorant opinion um, about like, oh, you should have stayed in or like, why don't you get more loans? And like, they're just going to say something without thinking about it, thinking about the positions people are in, people thinking about the systems that are going on. And I was like, oh, kill me. Like, I really have to deal with this now. Jordan doesn't begrudge his classmates who got lucky, but he understands that the student debt crisis is a systemic one that isn't going to be solved by random acts of charity. But also, like, this is not my fault. Like, if people wouldn't pay their taxes, we have been required, requiring the people to pay their taxes. And we had those morals and beliefs and cared about lives and black lives, black poor lives and middle class, not middle class, all lives, all black lives matter, then I wouldn't need the debt to be canceled off. And then also I would have graduated as well. I had my degree the same day with my friends and with the people who I had been working with, organizing with, studying with, learning with, growing with, collaborating with, and planning to do that in the future as well, Um, which I'm still doing just not with a degree from else. Jordan understands that the student debt crisis isn't going to be solved via the benevolence of billionaires. Don't individualize this problem. This is a systemic issue. This is something that all other kinds of people are dealing with as well. And you can't blame yourself for this. You've seen more else told you at the door from the gate saying like, look to your left, look to your right, that not everyone will graduate with you. Like you're going to lose one of your brothers or whatever, stuff like that. I can't blame myself. I have to keep going. And also... Just another reminder that charity is not the solution. You have to make real solutions. You have to make radical changes um, if you want to stop them make problems. So trying to use capitalism to save us is not going to work, really. So you have to really strategize. You have to really work with your community. You have to really plan together to do something better than that. And I think Black capitalism is not the option. It's not the solution. Jordan is currently enrolled in community college in Oakland and is still on track to get his degree. But there was a reason why he wanted to graduate from Morehouse. 
I wanted to start a video game publishing when I went to Morehouse. Like that was one of my big things. That's why I wanted the business degree so I could publish games made by black and queer folk about their experiences and made by them so we could have more diversity in the market as well. And also because they're such a great tool for telling stories. And also I like really enjoy studying the communities and video games and the societies that people make themselves. And it once like the developers make the world and how the, I like seeing what the community does with it. That's like one of the most fascinating things to me. There's a line of argument out there that says that everyone who took out student debt without a plan to earn the big bucks is a fool. But that ignores that many socially useful jobs, like policy jobs and public interest jobs, social work and teaching, require advanced degrees even though they don't come with big salaries. Moreover, that strictly utilitarian perspective on education has never been what's made this country the beacon of innovation and creativity it historically has been. People like often are like, well, you got yourself into this. You had the information available. You chose to get a degree in, you know, left-handed puppetry or whatever. <laughs> and now you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. It strikes me as like a very sort of utilitarian-minded idea of what education is or can be. That was Ben Dalton, our podcast producer, who I finally convinced to join me on the pod. Now, he made a good point. That as technology gets better, automation gets more common, and people need less labor to survive, purpose will be increasingly found in creative, caretaking, or scientific spheres where technology just hasn't quite caught up. Especially in the economy that we're moving into, where it's going to be you know, a, a mass group of people who are serving the whims of the super rich. Perhaps left-handed puppetry is exactly what they would like to see <laughs> us do for them. I don't buy the strict utilitarian, you, you should only get a degree in something that you know for sure is going to pay dividends. You know very well because you edit out a lot of my references to Star Trek. <laughs> the vision of a kind of utopian Star Trek future is one in which, yeah, there are, there's no need to work to make food or like to provide basic things for people anymore. So the jobs that folks have on the show are things like archaeologists. You know, Captain Jean-Luc Picard is a space archaeologist. That's what he trained in before, I guess, going to Starfleet and becoming a captain. And he was chosen to lead that mission through the stars because he has that background and he brings that to bear when he encounters new, new species, etc. And the idea that if we move into a world where there is automation and we don't need to like literally get trained and in trade anymore. The idea that that means like we are all just like lazy sitting at our computers is I think a really wrong way to think about it. I think that we should imagine a world where we're all more like scientists and explorers and, you know, doctors and, and people trying to figure out how to make our lives better in all the ways that machines are a long way from being able to do. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if the horizon of your politics isn't utopian, then what are you even doing? Now, what distinguishes Bernie's plan from the plans put forward by other candidates is that it treats education as a human right, not just a privilege for an elite few. To understand the thinking behind it, I chatted with Alex Haquez, who's on the policy team that helped draft the bill, along with representatives Ilhan Omar and Pramila Jayapal. So a lot of people are asking, why cancel debt for everyone? What's the logic there? Sure. So what we have now is a $1.6 trillion crisis. We have seen a whole generation of young people unable to start families, to buy homes, uh, to do the kinds of things uh, to set themselves up for a life that their parents had or their grandparents. But it's also not only a challenge for young people. Right now, we're seeing millions of uh, older Americans over 60 years old with thousands of dollars of student debt to pay. Uh, so really, we are just going to reset the in our entire failed uh, higher educational system, forgive all $1.6 trillion outstanding in student debt, and then going forward, make colleges and public colleges and university, universities tuition free. What we're also going to do going forward is cap uh, the interest rates that you pay on, uh, on student loans going forward. So if you do take out a student loan to go to a private uh, college or university, you're not going to pay any more than 1.88% interest. When Alex mentioned older Americans, I was reminded of Miss Allen, a woman I met in Texas at a rally earlier this year. Miss Allen went back to school for a late in life bachelor's degree and was now retired with six figures of debt. 
I was a police officer for 21 years here in the city of Houston, and, and I took serving, protecting and serving our community seriously. You know, I, I felt that that was so for everybody, not just for a select group. And I, I feel like Bernie is like that. He wants to help everybody. Now, realistically, can he? We don't know. But I'm gonna give it. But I'm gonna give him an opportunity. <laughs> See, I went to school late. I retired and then I finished school. So I have a, over a hundred thousand dollars worth. Between my bachelor's and my master's degree, I have a hundred thousand dollars worth. I need you to say that one more time. How much student loan debt? A uh, hundred, over a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. When you talk about the interest and everything else, yes. I got I got my bachelor's in 2005, and I got my master's in 2012. And between then and now. I have over $100,000 in student loan debt. Ms. Allen certainly understood the evils of interest firsthand. Compound interest is the best and the worst thing that could ever happen to you. If you're on the receiving end of it, it is fantastic. If you're on the, on the giving end, it's horrible. The government should not be in the business of enslaving its citizens. And that's what it is. That's what it feels like. It's, a, it's, a, it's another form it's of slavery. Hearing stories like this, there's such a disconnect with the prevailing narratives in the media. This is Alex again. So I think what you'll see is that you, you have to look again where folks are coming from. So if you look at folks that are taking out higher rates of, of student debt, there are often not coming from wealthier families. Folks that come from wealthier families often don't have to take out loans yeah. to go to school. No, no one takes out a 7% 7, 7 interest rate loan for shits and giggles. Sure. And... <laughs> You know, I think what we're seeing in a lot of industries, too, is uh, take my brother, for example. He's in medical school mm -hmm. and will graduate with about $220,000 worth of debt. And we need doctors in rural hospitals. We need them in VA facilities going into family medicine instead of dermatology and orthopedics yeah. where um, where you can make really good money. Uh, and it's hard to to get good doctors into some of those relatively lower paying jobs when they have hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt to pay back. Mm -hmm. Same thing with law school, I'm sure. You had classmates that mm -hmm. are now doing corporate law um, or doing something they don't maybe necessarily yeah, uh, believe in. Yeah, I mean, in. it was me until a little over a year ago, so I empathize a great deal. Sure. And what if we could you know, get those those same people into public defender roles right. and, and doing uh, nonprofit work and, and things like that. So so this is really a reset on on our higher educational system. More than half of, of uh, people that take out loans don't end up graduating. And then you're saddled with thousands of dollars of debt and then not even a degree to get that premium that you thought you were getting on future wages. So, so what is Bernie Sanders doing about the, the rising costs of, of college, right? Because that's part of the issue, that costs have grown so exponentially compared to the rate of inflation over the course of the last few decades. Definitely. And I think that's a place, you know, you'll see going back just, just 30, 40 years, costs of tuition have far, far exceeded not just inflation, but wage gains, too. Mm. So you're, you're paying even more and then coming out and making you know, just as much as you were in 1975. Um, so going forward, right, uh, all public colleges, universities, trade schools, two and four year, uh, will be tuition free. We're also, you know, expanding programs to help first generation students and, and students that don't necessarily have the, the institutional knowledge uh, as, as other students uh, might to help get them services that they can use to make sure they stay in school and get those degrees. And really, you know, just really transforming our notion of higher education into a right. I think that's that's Bernie's biggest um, biggest point here is that he wants to turn K through 12 education and then public colleges and universities into a fundamental right for being an American. Now, Alex was actually only one of two people I spoke to who didn't have debt. Not so coincidentally, he was also the only person I spoke to who owned a home. I have no outstanding student loan debt like so many of my friends do. And I hear their stories all the time, and I can't imagine if I had an extra two, three, four hundred dollar a month payment to make. Uh, I definitely 
probably wouldn't be uh, wouldn't have started in in politics. Uh, it's not as a listeners might be surprised to hear, uh, the place where you go to make the big bucks. <laughs> Unless you're a few blocks over on K Street. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the other Bernie staffer I spoke to, who was debt-free, was communication staffer Brianna Blewett, who went to college for free on her mom's GI Bill. Like Alex, Brianna says she wouldn't have been able to join this movement otherwise. I have ambitions to pursue a career in public service, but I think that Given the fact that, you know, starting salaries to work on Capitol Hill are $30,000 a year, et cetera, I don't think that that's necessarily sustainable to be able to pay off a surmountable amount of student loans, which luckily I do not have. But even with the debt that I do have, I still don't think that that would be an adequate salary. I think I'd probably be a little bit more inclined to take a job with a cushy consulting firm Mm -hmm. or something (laughs) like that. There are no shortage of those here in D.C., Mm -hmm. that's for sure. Um, But yeah, I think that I would be much more inclined to take some sort of job like that along those lines as opposed to a job in public service. Well, I'm glad we got you instead of Booz Allen. This is what makes me and so many other people with student debt so frustrated about the discourse. Moderates on both sides of the aisle insist that this is some kind of windfall for the rich. I do get concerned about paying for college for rich kids. I do. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're going to wipe out a trillion six in student debt? What about all the people who have prioritized their student debt pay down at the expense of their savings, their 401k investments, their home purchasing? It's absolute nonsense. You know the reason it's absolute nonsense? Because many rich people do take out student loan debt, specifically because they want their kids to have to pay off the debt. But far from a bunch of lazy rich kids, everyone I spoke to simply wanted to go to school to take care of their family or otherwise enrich their communities. The people who were complaining, well, they were the rich kids. I was talking about it today. I was so angry because me and my friend had a conversation Mm -hmm. and she was like, I don't understand. I don't really think it's a good idea, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, she has zero student debt. That's Ariana again. So she does not understand the struggle (laughs) is so real. And honestly, I hate it. I hate student debt. It's literally the worst thing also because I see like my parents are struggling to pay my student debt, Mm -hmm. my sisters and my brothers in college too. And Mm -hmm. on top of that, they have a mortgage. My dad just lost his job. So it's definitely been very difficult having to pay these student debt, student loans, everything. And it all just keeps adding up. So definitely if I did not have this debt, I would be helping pay my parents' mortgage. I would be saving up to buy a house for myself. Yeah, do you even think about that now as a real possibility? It's like not, (laughs) because I just have to focus on like paying the debt. So right now my monthly payments are $200 a month. Okay. So that's that's something that um, is feasible for me now. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, like a few months ago it wasn't because I wasn't making as much money as I I was. I I was working two jobs Mm -hmm. um, in order to, to stay afloat. That's Julia from our policy team. At the top of this episode, She's the one who said that but for her loan, she'd be able to save her retirement, purchase a home, or help out her parents. When you're on those like kind of pay-as-you-earn plans, does the interest continue to accrue? Yes, it does. Okay, so how what does your balance look like now versus when you graduate? Because a lot of people's balance is actually just getting larger. Um, I haven't looked into it too far. It's too depressing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, But that was also after like, months of trying to get my uh, loans consolidated to do the repayment program because some of my loans weren't qualifying for Mm -hmm. that. Um, So it was uh, a mess to actually figure that out. And um, I didn't have someone that knew the system well, so I had to do it on my own and figure out what the best and most uh, efficient way to pay my loans off. And it's incredibly difficult. Even even listeners, for someone who's on our policy team, Yeah, <laughs> you can be brilliant and very qualified to be looking through this kind of thing and still have a difficult time sorting it all out. Yes. So you did cons- consolidate your loans? Yes, I did. And a lot of people have been asking me, if you have consolidated loans, does Bernie's loan cancellation plan still apply to you? And the answer is? Yes, absolutely. And the fact that so many of us folks in our early 30s haven't started saving for retirement It's setting up our society for a serious crisis. This is Julia again. Have you been able to save at all so far? 
No, not at all. Right now, I'm I'm working on paying my loans, and my just, you know, make, making sure that I'm I'm able to live here in DC. And here's Malika. I'm really limited in terms of like saving for anything. I just in my 30s just started putting money into like a, a retirement account, and it's a, it's tight. It's not even like a Roth or anything yet. But I just started doing that and I'm 33 and I know a lot of people who've been doing this, you know, since their 20s, but I just literally couldn't. And then, you know, I'm a first generation professional. You know, I didn't have anybody else in my family who would like gone to law school or went to med school or B school or anything. And when it comes to kind of helping out with my family, like I also have to take out money for that too. So You know, I would have a lot more freedom in terms of kind of my own financial opportunities, like buying a home or thinking about, I I can't think about kids right now. I can't afford it. And I'm 33, like I'm about to be 34 and I can't afford, I cannot afford a child. I cannot afford childcare. And yeah, it's, it's having quite an impact on my life. I was really in the state of economic anxiety pretty much all last year because I was I was nervous about, you know, what a career transition would look like, A, without having financial security, because I, I would like to write full time. Don't tell my bosses that. <laughs> <laughs> they won't hear this. Just kidding. But I would like to do that full time. I just can't right now. I want, you know, health coverage. And, you know, I want to be able to start thinking about a family, which I thought I'd be doing by 28. And lo and behold, that has not happened yet because I, I just can't afford to. If you're talking to, you know, black people like we are and saying if you want to participate, if you want to compete, if you want to have true access and equality in society, you should go and get these educations, but not really take into account that we are taking out more debt than other people because our families don't have the same resources because of generational wealth divides um, and that we are burdened longer after we graduate than other groups. Um, what you're basically saying is that elite, as those elite, that kind of education, which is supposed to be a leg up, is only reserved for people who already have means. And that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing in this country. The media blames millennials for everything. Literally. There are articles blaming us for the decline of diamond sales, house sales, the golf industry, the music business, the napkin industry, vacation, relationships, Home Depot, suits, and even the American dream itself. But what if? What if the problem isn't with millennials, but the fact that we just don't have the disposable income to spend on those things? This is Erica again who is currently in the middle of her own personal student debt crisis. I just got a call like yesterday from like a debt collector because I'm supposed to be taking classes in the fall. And they were like, yeah, you owe about 10500 That's due before classes start in the fall. Oh. So I have to make sure I, I have to take out another loan to clear that balance out. My father's an immigrant. So that, that was the reason he came here. Like, he got a, um education, like, lottery opportunity mm. from his home country. Mm. And he came here, he studied, and he worked two and three jobs while he was in college. But at that time, he was able to, like, you know, that combined with, like, scholarship, he was able to put himself through school. Yeah. It's not like that now. I'm the first child in my family to go to school. There's mm-hmm. three of us. I don't know if my parents... I don't know if they realized how much things had changed since they were in school. Yeah. I asked Erica, and everyone I spoke to, when Bernie wins and cancels all student debt, what will you do? How will it change your life? Imagine a world where you have zero student debt and college and grad school, education in America is free. How does that change how you make decisions for tomorrow and next year. Oh, I could save. I could get married. I could start a family. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go into like a committed relationship with all of this debt. But I could have, I could buy a house. Yeah. Yeah. It's, It's amazing to me. Like my mother, 
she'll um, pick at me sometimes. When I was your age, I had two kids and a, a mortgage and two car payments. Um, yep. And I'm like, okay. May I ask what your you age want is? a cookie? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a cookie, mommy? <laughs> you know, it's not about avocado toast. You know, we're not just a superficial <laughs> generation. We actually do want to meet the milestones that the generations before us have met. Um, so we get all these like we get all these like crazy articles, right? Like the millennials are destroying the diamond industry. Well, we're not getting married. I'm the the millennials you. are destroying the housing industry. Well, we can't afford to buy homes. And I don't think that certain older gener- generations or privileged people in other respects fully understand how much that's not just rhetoric. It is truly something that comes up again and again when I'm talking to my peers about the choices that we're making. How did you feel when you found out that Bernie Sanders was going to cancel all student debt? I think I could have two-step <laughs> in my living room. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. Thank God. Thank God. It's like, put this man in the White House. Please put this man in the White House. This is going to be amazing. Because there's so there's so many things that you can do when you don't have that enormous amount of debt lingering over your head. I, I feel like people are going to be elderly still dealing with this debt if this doesn't happen. Yeah, 40,000 40, uh, seniors had their Social Security checks garnished for tuition payments in 2015. That's disgusting. (laughs) Yep. Already on a fixed income, a lot of them. Yep. But we're going to fix it. Yeah, we are. It is time to hit the reset button. Under the proposal that we introduced today, all student debt would be canceled in six months. By taking this action, By taking this action, we not only provide immediate financial relief to 45 million Americans who have $1.6 trillion in debt, but we will be improving the entire economy. Let's be clear. The millennial generation was told that the only way they would get the good jobs available is if they received a college education. Unfortunately, that turned out to be bad advice. It was wrong. That's it for this week. As always, please share your ideas and feedback at heartheburn at berniesanders.com or send us a tweet with the hashtag heartheburn. If you haven't already, please take a moment to rate, review, or like us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever you're listening. As always, transcripts will be up soon. Till next time. <laughs>